We'd like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that we are gathered together upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. The land beneath and around us is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, a pact between the Anishabe and Haudenosaunee to care for the lands around the Great Lakes. We share this land and celebrate its gifts and are thankful to live and work in a place that has sustained human activity for over 15,000 years. As settlers, we acknowledge our responsibility to listen, learn, and evolve in the spirit of these historic covenants, honoring the earth, living in balance with the land, and taking only what we need. Honoring First Nations as we take on the important work of reconciliation. In doing so, we seek to forge new and respectful relationships with the indigenous nations of this region and throughout Turtle Island. We strive to work collaboratively and to keep the importance of our shared history, friendship, and future relationships alive in our minds and hearts. Well, hello everybody, and welcome back to our second day of Reclaiming Hamilton's mini conference. Uh, I am Noelle Allen. I am the publisher for Woolsack and Win, which is uh, the company that was lucky enough to bring out this great book. Um, and today we're going to be talking about some of the big questions that have troubled Hamilton in the last little while. And to do this, I'm going to turn the stage over to Jason Allen, and he is going to run the program for the panel today for us. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Jason. Jason Allen is the host of the Environmental Urbanist on 93.3 CFMU, Tuesdays at 1 p.m., where he explores the intersection of cities and climate change. A longtime Hamilton resident, he has been active in neighborhood organizing, city politics, and anti-hate work. As the founder of Woodcraft Canada, Jason has also spent many years as a youth leader who specializes in getting kids into the outdoors in a diverse and inclusive way. And I am just going to turn this over to Jason to introduce the panelists and bring us through these wonderful questions. Thanks, Noel. So welcome to everybody to a discussion about the big questions that have been facing Hamilton. So last night's panel, uh, if you were able to take it in with Margaret Schimba, Sarah Wayland, and Matthew Bin and Noel um, moderating, was a great discussion about the long-term history of Hamilton. So starting back from uh, uh, the time of the First Peoples, working their way all the way through to more recent events uh, of, in terms around land speculation, how Hamilton got started, all the sort of historical stuff, the waves of immigration. It was a great discussion about the long-term history of Hamilton. Today, though, we're going to talk about what's been plaguing us for about the last 10 or 15 years. And those are what we're calling the big questions of, of Hamilton today. And those big questions are around um, three things that have really come to a crisis point in the last 24 months. Uh, the f one of them we're going to talk about is, we're going to introduce the panelists in a second. One we're going to talk about is LRT, which uh, has, has been boiling under the surface for the last 10 or 15 years, but in the last year or so, uh, we reached a bit of a crisis point. We're going to talk about affordable housing, and if you've been seeing what's been happening with the encampments in Hamilton and how uh, tough that situation has been, that's kind of come to a boil in the last year. Uh, and we're also going to talk about racism and systemic racism and how big a challenge that has been in Hamilton, especially for, for forever, but especially in the last year or so. And to do that, I have three guests that I'm really excited to talk to you about, uh, talk to with today. So, guess that you will know well if you ever read The Spectator or, uh, or are active in Hamilton politics. Uh, right beside me is Sarah Jama. She's a community organizer from Hamilton. She's the co-founder of the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, an organization committed to building the political and community power of people with disabilities. She currently works at the, center, at the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion as a senior program coordinator. In her current role, she is building leadership curriculum for youth around organizing inside and outside political structures to be dis disseminated locally at different schools. Next to her is Sean Selway. He has a BA in religion from McMaster and an industrial mechanic license from the province of Ontario via the Steel Company of Canada Basic Works here in Hamilton. He's broadly interested in questions of material culture and the intended paradoxes. And he writes about municipal planning issues for local blogs and is the author of Nobody Here Will Harm You from the Woolsack and Wynn, a book about the mass medical evacuation from the Eastern Arctic during the second half of the 20th century. And Long way from me over there is Ryan McGreal. He's the editor of Raise the Hammer, a website focused on civic affairs here in Hamilton. He's a founding volunteer with Hamilton Light Rail, a citizen group dedicated to bringing light rail transit to Hamilton. His writing has been published in the Hamilton Spectator, Hamilton Magazine, The Walrus, HuffPost, and Behind the Numbers. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. 
Glad to have you here. So my first question, and we're going to talk about sort of all three issues pretty equally over the course of the next hour and a bit. But my first question is sort of one of the issues that I think has been underpinning this whole thing, and that's been the issue of, of equity and discrimination and racism and all that stuff. And so my first question is for Sarah. It feels to me like 2019, especially, was kind of the year of hate in Hamilton. We had uh, the Yellow Vest at City Hall. We had the incident at the Pride Festival. We had the, the Mealy at the Maxine Bernier event, uh, which unfortunately I was there for. Um, we found out that we were the hate crime capital of Canada. Right? It wasn't a great year for, for diversity and inclusion. Has racism gotten worse in, in the last year or so in Hamilton, or is this, is this just the surfacing of a problem we've had for a long time? I think it's the latter. It's the surfacing of a... It's the... What we're seeing is a culmination of people also speaking up and organizing against what was going on. Hmm. So you had the fascists in front of City Hall, but then you also had the response to that. You had the fascists show up at Pride, but you also had the response to that. So I think what we're seeing is not that racism is getting worse. It's always been bad, but I think people are getting more organized hmm. and responding and speaking about racism here in Hamilton. Hmm. Interesting. Any thoughts from uh, you gentlemen? We're good? Okay. So my next question is for... Um, Lost my page. I got lots of questions for Sarah. For Sean. Sean, you wrote a lot about uh, affordable housing in your book, and you wrote a particular, uh, about a particular fight to maintain an affordable housing building uh, in, your, in your article, in your piece. Yeah, this was uh, Greenwind, uh, which is a real estate, large real estate company from Toronto, came to town and bought buildings at John and Euston, uh, two large apartment buildings. And then they proceeded to try and persuade people to leave. And then they began renovating the units. But what is significant about that building is that there were a large number of three-bedroom apartments there. And Greenwood proposed to convert them essentially all to one-bedroom apartments. Mm. And there was a considerable struggle over that because the problem is not only the question of affordability, but the question of accommodation for families. And so eventually, as I recount in the, in the piece in the book, uh, there was a settlement reached whereby they maintained a much higher number of the three bedroom units than they had originally intended to do. But this combination of displacement and shrinkage of actual units away from family size down to one bedroom units is um, pretty much typifies the problem that we've been facing in Hamilton on questions of affordability. Um, because the last reservoir of affordable units actually was in the large high rise buildings. Now real estate investment tr trusts have bought up many of those buildings and they have proceeded to do what they, they call reposition the building in the market, which is essentially because we have vacancy decontrol in, in Ontario, which means that if you can get your tenant out, then you can charge whatever you want for that unit to the next tenant coming in. There's a strong incentive for real estate investment trusts to try and get the existing tenants out and new people in. And this has created a, a serious problem, which has eventually, as we see, produced this phenomenon of tent cities at the bottom of the housing market, where you have people that are normally characterized as those who are difficult to house. Um, it, it seems to be the case, however, that there are people joining the ranks of the previously difficult to house who are there for reasons other than their particular individual problems. But because of the general systemic nature of the kind of displacement that's been occurring in Hamilton. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a yeah, fantastic point. Any other, any to add to that? Yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I have a tendency to want to go straight to the, to the 30,000 foot level. So pull me back to ground if I'm doing that. But. The thing that, that I see as kind of unifying these issues uh, in Hamilton specifically and more generally is for the past 40 years, we've been living under a kind of a neoliberal consensus, a bipartisan consensus of low taxes and deregulation and disempowering 
um, organized community in order to concentrate more and more wealth and power in, you know, not even the 1%, the 0.1%, you mm-hmm. know, the 0.01%. And, uh, and the result of that has been a kind of um, a game of musical chairs for everything else. You know, median incomes have been stagnant in Canada for 40 years now. Um, you know, uh, people, you know, in the bottom two, uh, you know, quintiles have actually seen their wealth and income fall significantly over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and meanwhile, as people at the top concentrate more wealth, that gives them more power to influence political parties so that whether the liberals or the conservatives are in power, they have some pretty sharp differences on social policy. But in terms of the underlying economic and fiscal policies, they're very much aligned. So, um, you know, in Ontario, 15 years after the Liberals won in 2003, um, effective, like sort of real inflation adjusted um, social assistance uh, rates were the same as they were when Mike Harris slashed them in the 90s. So, uh, you know, we're like the, uh, the affordable housing issue um, in a lot of ways uh, is an issue of, of just general affordability in life. It's an issue of, of systemic economic inequality. Yeah, if I may add to that, and then I will, I will take this to Sarah. I didn't quite understand the format. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we're we're, 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 we're supposed to there. comment on each other. I think that um, one of the problems that we've had here is that the the politicians have decided, they've written a job description for themselves which is quite inadequate, which is simply, our task is to keep taxes down. If we do that, then you should re-elect us. And so they don't do anything else. They don't, they certainly don't deal with questions of affordability. They don't deal with questions of historic or or natural preservation. They just don't do anything, uh, really, except meet this one mandate. Um, And it is, in my opinion, it is, it is folly to continue to try and, and ask the politicians to do things which they simply do not want to do. Yeah. And so if we want to make some gains, then we have to shift tactics. We have to actually interrupt the circuit of capital. You have to have a rent strike. You have to withhold the money so that the capital doesn't continue to circulate, so that your land, the owner of your building the real estate investment trust does not have the money to redistribute to their shareholders. And then you must negotiate a, a deal with them in order to maintain livable uh, uh, and affordable accommodation for yourself. Just as in the past, uh, in the late 40s, Hamilton workers organized within their factories in order to make a deal they interrupted the flow of capital in order to make a deal with the owner of that factory. And similarly, on other fronts, you see the environmental movement actually does not appeal only to politicians. They try and encourage disinvestment. They cut off the flow of money. And they also engage in direct action. They actually interfere with construction projects from time to time. And this is what we've seen with Black Lives Matter, which I find very encouraging. Just stop asking politicians to do things which they simply do not want to do. do. And start forcing other players, people with money and power, to become more cooperative, which is what Black Lives Matter and other organizations have actually begun to do. We see that in in the indigenous movement very much. It's happening very much out in Caledonia now. Sarah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think some of the issues with the affordable housing crisis in Hamilton that people aren't really talking about is the fact that Hamilton has the largest density of people with disabilities in the whole province of Ontario. Wow. So this conversation that like some people are just not houseable, it is really messed up in the sense that if these people are elected to represent um, people <laughs> in our city who need, who need and have the right to live in certain places, um, they should be making decisions to protect these people. Yes. And what we see is Jason Farr was more concerned about his legacy around a boulevard um, than he was in terms of protecting people in encampments. We see like that this, this protocol is being manipulated um, by people and, and particularly counselors to, to push the Hamilton police into like dismantling 
encampments, right? Because of this 14 day notice sort of bullshit. And so what we see is now we have over 20 encampments in Hamilton and people are hopping from place to place to place, unable to organize, unable to build community, unable to stick together and say, we're going to stay and separated from services. So this protocol negotiation um, that was done with the city, I argue, made things worse. I, I do think the answer is to organize, but I get worried about these conversations because when we think about like rent strikes, um, we want to make sure that the onus is not on people of color and people with disabilities to be doing that work on their own and mm -hmm. withholding the rent. What we yeah. see was a lot of Somali communities that I was in conversations with in Hamilton who were talking about rent strikes um, were confused about their rights because things weren't being translated into different languages. And then what happens? Like the people who can afford to like be done with the rent strike, are done with the rent strike, and the people who um, will get evicted later on, get evicted later on with nowhere to go, right? So when we're talking about actually organizing collectively, I think it does need to be people who are working class on the front line um, doing that political work, but then it also needs to be entire communities, people with privilege and power and capacity, stepping up to be like, yo, I'm, a hold, I'm gonna withhold my rent too. I'm gonna be out there with you. I'm gonna go to the encampments being torn down. What I was frustrated by was not the fact that <laughs> the politicians who who wanted the encampments to be torn down, uh, were torn down. I was frustrated by the fact that the politicians who were against the encampments being torn down, not showing up. Like, so, like the onus is on people on the ground constantly to be responding to these issues and like filming it and putting ourselves at risk and being like, hey, like shit is messed up right now. People are being harmed, attacked by police, and then we de-escalate. And then the people in positions of power that we kill ourselves to elect, don't show up in the moment or don't really respond or it's not in their mandate or it's not in their focus point at that time. So you're right. The answer is not to focus on trying to get people into positions of power. It's to figure out how to organize. But we cannot do it by ourselves, right? Disabled people can't do it by ourselves. The working class uh, <laughs> um, needs to be united to make sure that um, it's all of us or none of us. So all of us need to show up when the encampments are being torn down. All of us need to figure out how to go to land back and support. It's not about just showing up, taking pictures and leaving. And what I'm seeing is like this neoliberal sort of response to what organizing is now. And I think that has to do with like online culture. It's like, oh, well, I'm gonna go to land back, take a picture and leave. Yeah. But really, it's like, no, what people need from you at land back is to sleep over yeah. so that the indigenous people can sleep yeah. <laughs> and, and, and take, take a break. A break. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they're asked was, sleep over. It's not to show up to the legal site to take a photo and then to go home. If you're part of a union, if you're part of people in positions of power, sleep over. Use that, use that leverage, right? Don't just tether the line of being comfortable, right? A lot of us are getting tired of watching that happen over and over and over again. Now is the time for political courage and to sort of flex that so the rest of us can actually have faith that when push comes to shove, you will be there with us. We had so much of a challenge yeah. during the yellow, anti-yellow, anti-hate protests at, at City Hall last summer. Uh, some of us, I wasn't there every week, but I was there probably three quarters of the time. Uh, and to your point, I think I saw three polit politicians the whole time I was there, uh, and uh, to their credit. Um, but. Uh, just getting other folks who were not threatened by those yellow vesters from communities who weren't threatened by the yellow vesters to show up and put themselves on the line was a challenge. And some of our allies got arrested uh, for defending themselves. Uh, and it was, uh, I think all of your points sort of on that, on, that, on that matter are absolutely spot on. Yeah, Sean, you're kind of. Yeah, this is what is, what is missing is solidarity. Mm -hmm. This is the basic thing, like what matters in life? It's your personal friendships and the people that you meet and get to know and so on is what really matters. And we have, we do not have cross-class solidarity in the way that we ought to. And the politicians are completely negligent because when people complain about the encampments, for example, it's the politicians, instead of saying, listen, we need to show solidarity, we need to assist these people, and we should all be working on this together because that is what actually matters, not your car, your clothes, and so on, right? That, that's, it's not there. It's a basic element of life which is gradually evaporated. And we would, if we could get it back, then we would all feel much better all of the time. 
one of my favorite Ryan McGreal phrases is that is, one of my favorite phrases of yours around that is, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Yeah, the lack of solidarity is by design. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you create a, a system of uh, a culture of oppression and, and a system of constant deficit, you know, the, the right. musical chairs where you keep taking chairs away, um, it makes it harder for people to build solidarity because now you're fighting for the scrap that, that's going to allow you to survive instead of recognizing that if you work together with people that you're all going to end up being able to, to be more secure and have more equity and more yeah. justice. And so, you know, uh, communities of, 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 of various different uh, ways of being marginalized are, you know, they're, they're under attack yeah. and, they're, and they're trying to survive. And it's, uh, you know, and people who are not immediately under attack have this sense of, well, at least it's not happening to me. You know, and then again, that drives a wedge between communities and, and, it, and it breaks up the allyship that we need. I have been at parent council meetings where a school board trustee has said to the parent council, uh, that I was sitting with, that they needed to be very cautious of this school on the other side of the ward, uh, because it was doing a very good job of advocating and getting the resources that this council should be uh, entitled to. So it was this example of division, even amongst politicians, encouraging people to pit themselves in each other. Absolutely true. Sarah? It's a, we also have a, a problem in Hamilton where people with, um, without lived experience, as much as I hate that term, will go off and negotiate things on behalf of the city, like <laughs> with the city or uh, with yeah. the police and like actually actively make things worse over time, right? Um, not, not in ways that are intentional, but I definitely still like after watching multiple encampments get torn down and trying to like work with people to start an encampment support network, um, like I, I think the protocol situation didn't make, it didn't make sense. Right, because we weren't in a position where we had the the community capacity to protect people. So, so why go sign a protocol that's giving the city and police room to decide? Okay, here's when we could tell people to leave, right? And actually, in the long term, make things worse. So, like before stepping in to like negotiate with the city, how are you building community and collective power first, mm -hmm. right? And I think sure that takes right, courage. How are you making sure the right voices yes, are on the table? I think there, like, you need to look at then the short term, the medium term, the long term solution. And one of the very practical things that we have yet to do here is to develop modular housing. When um, some years ago I was on a job in Labrador City wow. and they have there a huge bunkhouse. The, the rooms are quite small, but they each have you know, a desk, a bed, a washroom. You don't need a lot because you're away most of the day when you're in that situation. But these, if if, if a company wants to develop a coal mine somewhere in BC, they do it. They put that housing there. They need the, the housing for people to actually work to develop the mine. They put, like three blocks from here, there's a place that actually manufactures huge um, hydro substations, which you drop into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere and provides power for these buildings while the whole, the whole establishment is being constructed there. We have lots of land in Hamilton where we could simply put this modular housing and actually have a place to house people rather than then moving from tent encampment to tent encampment. And we simply need to decide to do that. It is not even particularly expensive. And when the land becomes up for development, then okay, you, you disassemble your modular housing and you move it over onto the next lot so that at least you have a, a floor through which people cannot fall, mm. so that they don't freeze to death in the wintertime, yeah. which happens two or three times every year here. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing, like people who are, who are homeless, who are disabled, who are, who are struggling with mental health concerns, who are addicted to, who are in circumstances outside of their control, like they're not seen as valuable, they're not seen as having the right to exist in Hamilton, they're not seen as our neighbors. And so why would people in positions of power who've been sitting in comfortable seats for 20 years even think about similar solutions like that? They won't because they don't care because these people are not human to them. That's no, it's what? always a question of, well, they won't submit to the discipline that we want to impose and therefore they don't qualify for our assistance, which is nonsense. Or even worse, you hear language like, oh, these homeless people are invading our community. It's yeah. like, these are your neighbors. These are human beings. Yeah. They're not invading your community. They're trying to live. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, the, the, the problem is that that would require the government at all levels to actually recognize that housing is a, 
is a, a, a field that they need to be in. In Canada, we've, we've essentially, um, we've ceded housing to the private sector. We've decided that housing is, is, a, is a commodity that the market can provide. And so the market provides the kind of housing that people who have a lot of money want. And, uh, and, you know, if, if you look at cities around the world that have actually made meaningful progress in housing for all, they are cities where the local government in cooperation with higher levels has become an active player in providing and, and maintaining housing. You know, where, you know, where um, you know, if a new private development comes in, it's not enough to say, oh, well, you know what, 5% of your units have to be affordable. And by affordable, we may only mean only like no more than 10% higher than the average market rate. Like these crazy unrealistic definitions of affordable, no. 25, 50% of your units have to be affordable. And by affordable, we mean 60% below market rates. And, and here is money to make that happen. And that's not happening here. But how do you do that no. in a city where the politicians are invested in keeping the rate of tax increase to zero? Not sorry, only just, that. Could you repeat that and speak yeah, up? Yeah, sure. How do you sorry. do that in a city where the politicians are invested and whose re-election hinges on keeping the increase in the property tax rate to zero? Someone's got to spend some money at some point. Well, and that, I don't... I don't think their re-election actually depends on that. I think that the, that the voters are do, yeah. a lot more sophisticated than that. But if, you, if, you, if all that you're offering them is this minimum thing of no tax increase, it doesn't matter what you pay in taxes, it's what you get for it. You know. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, it is not only the people that are at the bottom that have no housing at all, but there are, you know, younger people that are trying to start out and start families are not able to uh, uh, buy a house or pay affordable rent. And then there are the working poor, so-called, people who are employed but who can't. But because there is a complete disconnect between the wage rate mm. and the price of housing now, either rental or to purchase, they, they are not able to get into the market as well. And you have also the many the many newcomers which we need to bring here because uh, we are not having enough children and because those people need to get into better circumstances and to help the people where they are coming from. And then you have the many students who are, who are recent graduates who are at the beginning of their careers. They also have, we need to have those people here in the city as well. So the city's economic strategy needs to shift in order to include housing as a public utility in order that we can keep the students, that we can get immigrants to come to Canada and to actually live here in Hamilton, and in order that the, the people who are here already can continue to stay here, rather than having to move, which I'm convinced is the general yeah. the politician's attitude at the moment. They think that people are somehow going to leave town but the situation is not better anywhere else because housing is a commodity everywhere. Sure. So we have, housing is a right. And the liberals have reaffirmed, the governing party has reaffirmed this right. And they mumble a little bit and they <laughs> put money in the budget and so on. But the money never flows. Yeah. And you don't have, each city needs to have a, um, a housing authority which would build this public housing and operate it as a public utility. There are a variety of means to do this. It's not, it's not all new territory at all. It's been explored in many parts of the world. We know how to do it. It's just that we, for some, persist in refusing to do it because the market must be served. Once you start taking land off the market in order to provide affordability, then you will see great resistance yeah. from private developers. Yeah, for sure. And that's where, the, that's where the struggle will really begin. I, I really agree with you. I think in the same way that, although it's not perfect, universal health care has become yes. part of Canadian culture. Yes. Yes. Like, why is it so absurd to, to believe that if housing is a human right, we would provide housing to people? For, yes. I would say for free. Yes. Right? In the same way water technically is, it's a human right, it should be free, it should be accessible to everybody who would need it, right? Why are we continuing to commodify something that everybody should have the right to um, over and over and over again? I think actually to, to fix this issue, we need to see 
housing as important as we treat our health care in this country. So I completely agree in that sort of sense. And if you, if you think, if we didn't have universal health care today, and somebody said, we should bring in a universal health care system, the, <laughs> the, 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 the... World War III. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the ground would be soaked with the blood of all the heads exploding. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, it would be unthinkable if it wasn't already, as you say, kind of baked into the Canadian identity, because we, we established, you know, I'll put quote-unquote under, under, around universal, because, um, I mean, pharmacare coverage is a giant missing... Uh, link in that, but um, we established universal health care, in incidentally, with a liberal minority government supported by the NDP in the yeah, 1960s, <laughs> um, at a time when there was still a kind of pervasive belief that we could create a more just, more equitable society. We have been living for so long in, in an environment where our aspirations have become very small. You know, all we can really do is keep taxes low. You know, and hope that Jeff Bezos sprinkles some candy onto our city. You know, that, <laughs> this is not, it's not economically sustainable. It's not socially and culturally sustainable. It is, I mean, it, it is a crisis that has been in the making for decades. And we're seeing the point where it, has, it is becoming untenable now. And something is going to give. Okay, so that leads me to a great segue about our vision getting smaller and smaller and our aspirations getting smaller and smaller. Let's talk about LRT. Oh my God, <laughs> Everybody kind of goes, oh no! So I'm going to ask you a big question that has a million answers, but I'm going to ask you to sort of narrow it down. Where did things go so horribly wrong? <laughs> At what moment did, did sort of you as an LRT advocate wake up and realize and think, this, this actually is in serious jeopardy? Because we kind of snatched defeat from the jaws of victory a few times now. But was there a moment for you when you sort of woke up and said, this is in trouble? I mean, it's been a succession of such moments. Uh, I think, for me, uh, I, never, I never set out to be kind of, quote unquote, the LRT guy, for, <laughs> for better or for worse. In, in 2007, the province announced uh, Move Ontario 2020. You know, up until that point... The province hadn't built any new rapid transit in decades. You know, since since the Scarborough RT. Since the I guess the Scarborough RT, you know, might have been the last the last new uh, dedicated rapid transit that the province had built, and that was 30 years before. So the Liberals came in. They said we need we need to build rapid transit. The city, the Greater Toronto Area, has been growing for. For decades now, or, you know, you can't add any more lanes to the 401. Um, you know, the TTC is, is groaning. We need to add um, transit capacity, high capacity rapid transit. And so they announced funding, and they specifically announced two light rail transit lines in Hamilton. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds great. Um, you know, so I, I, uh, I contacted the city and said, so what are we doing about this? And it was crickets. <laughs> so I actually... Um, got a meeting with the Public Works uh, general manager at the time, Scott Stewart, who has since gone on. I think he's, he was working with the city of Burlington. I'm not too sure where he is now. And I said, so what are we, like the province has said they want to build uh, LRT in Hamilton. What are we doing about that? And he said, well, we're not doing anything about it. We don't have a plan. We don't have a strategy. It's not really part of our, of our transit vision. And I said, well, why isn't it? This is a game changer. Like the province wants to fully fund a new rapid transit line serving Hamilton. Why wouldn't we be excited about that? And I think that lack of enthusiasm at the beginning is the red flag that I should have paid more attention to because every single step away, uh, or along the way, there has been a complete and utter lack of enthusiasm from the local government. Um, senior management didn't want to deal with it. Council sort of saw it as... I don't know. I, I, I honestly think the only reason that they voted for it so many times is that they assumed the province wouldn't deliver. <laughs> and they'd be able to say, well, we asked for it. You know. Do their best. Uh, when the province actually uh, called their bluff and announced full funding, I mean, Terry White had, had a meltdown. You know, it was... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a crisis for them because they suddenly realized that the province had, um, had called their bluff. And, uh, and so the undermining of confidence that the city would be a reliable partner has been a constant headwind against this project. The fear among local councillors is that this might actually transform the balance of power ever so slightly, that this might provide a high-quality service to a traditionally marginalized uh, area of the city, I think really terrified them. 
and, and they have been undermining it and kind of dragging it and slowing it down and slow walking it and fear mongering about it every single step of the way. And for something this difficult to, um, to actually put together, uh, I mean, if you can stall it for long enough, eventually the kind of, you know, the alignment of the stars that makes it possible falls apart and then the whole project goes into jeopardy and that's where we are now. Is this? Yeah, I'm Go ahead. Find a comment. Go ahead, yeah, of course. It to be a bigger mystery even than, than Brian is saying because I believe that the LRT project is actually a property development project more than a transportation project in my opinion. And so it really does not make sense for the city to undermine its attempts to increase assessment in that whole corridor, which is essentially what the project is, is about. And I, I must say also that absent from the debate until fairly recently has been this question again of displacement from the LRT corridor. I don't know why that happened exactly, but there was not a debate properly. Like Ryan and I agree on many things, but I think we would differ on this question of property uplift in the LRT corridor. And so we ought to have had that out four or five years ago. And now what is occurring is that you are likely to get, you have the, a, 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 an area which is going to be cleared because they're going to proceed to demolition there. And you'll have a lot of vacant property there. But the city's program of, of, of um, value uplift on those lands can likely continue even if the LRT is not there. And that means that that entire area becomes subject to the to, to cycle of disinvestment, which is it is in now, followed by reinvestment, which, which causes a great deal of displacement. So once again, you have areas which are uh, not quite affordable anymore, but, but the cheaper parts of the city to live in, which are going to be uplifted, and people will be pushed out of those areas again. And there is no, the city ought to be looking at dealing with that problem before. But because they are continually seeking assessment, because essentially the idea is that the more money that you can get out of downtown, the less you will have to charge your suburban taxpayers mm -hmm. for whatever services, right? This, this notion, again, continues to bedevil us. It is, not, it is not what you pay in taxes, it is what you get, and how, how responsibly everyone is being treated in the city. Sir? It's not a business. It's not a business. I actually think people were sounding the alarm, right? There was the Hamilton Acorn, there was the Tenant Solidarity Network, there were small businesses, a lot of people from what I was seeing, we're ringing, sounding the alarm saying, wait, what about all the people that will be displaced and all the harm that this could cause? And like, I'm for transit and I'm, I was for the LRT, but I remember thinking, okay, what about the harm? Like, who's gonna talk about that? I think that when we talk about organizing and the pitfalls of organizing in Hamilton, we get so hyper-focused on issues that we're not actually having a broader conversation with community to, to talk about things holistically, right? So what I saw over time were the dissenting voices being like villainized uh, in this conversation of like, oh, well, that means you're against transit. And now what we're seeing is on the 21st, all of these properties are gonna start to be demolished. And again, some of us are gonna have to go and be like, yo, like, let's have a press conference, let's try to talk about this. Why isn't this being given to affordable housing? But again, that's after the fact. And again, that's like housing advocates after the fact, now being given the mic to say, okay, go, right? But this conversation should have been had with the people who were the dissenting voices in the beginning, but they didn't maybe have the same political capital as the people that were pushing for the LRT. And so when we talk about allyship in the moment when we're having these conversations, how can the people with the political capital who are pushing for an interest work with and sit down with the dissenting voices over time to make sure you're causing the least amount of harm? Because whatever is gonna happen now, within the next few weeks, will be completely reactive, and it's again on housing advocates uh, to, to respond. Right? It's far too late now, yeah. no, in, in that corridor, no. I had a very quick question at the doors in 2018. 
when uh, I was talking about both LRT and the possibility for affordable housing in terms of things like inclusionary zoning. For those who don't know, that's when you go back to the, the builder and say, you must put in a certain amount of affordable housing into your building if you're going to get the height you want. Uh, and you've already sort of alluded to how ineffective that is. But I, I talked about sort of how inclusionary zoning could sort of possibly help with the affordable housing program along the, the, the corridor. And the person looked me dead in the eye and said, honestly, what do you think the appetite is around city council for forcing developers to add affordable housing to their beautiful high rises uh, along the LRT corridor, and I was stuck. It was a difficult question. It, it's it's a it's a real it's a real problem in the city that it was it was so difficult to try and get um, any kind of, of kind of forward momentum on this. I think a lot of LRT advocates, and, and I think I can probably include myself, you know, at least some level in that, uh, you know. I've tried, I tried to sort of have that conversation on an ongoing basis about we can build rapid transit, we can have a housing policy, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, but I think, there was a, I think there was also, a, a, and I'm speaking you know, certainly on my own behalf, a, a fear of if we start engaging that conversation when we can't even get agreement from council that we should accept full funding for a transit investment, it just becomes another way for people who don't want anything to happen to uh, to obstruct this 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 project. And and I I think um, I think I think fear in some ways led us uh, to take the wrong approach there. And uh, and in, you know one of the things that I've learned from this is that uh, allyship and solidarity upfront and doing that hard work of building trust first is more important than kind of being afraid of having the difficult conversation and hoping that you can kind of push it down the line and say, let's get this thing locked down and then we'll worry about solving that problem. You know, and uh, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, obviously we weren't successful at getting LRT anyhow. Uh, and that might still change in 10 or 20 or 70 or 180 years, but uh, <laughs> Sky train time it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's been a really, really frustrating and also enlightening exercise in, um, in how easy it is to pit constituencies against each other when they should be advocating for the same thing and when, in fact, they generally agree on what needs to be done. I, I've seen this issue, too, where it's like, Sometimes it's a lot easier to listen to the same voices in Hamilton because you're often given the mic. Like people give me the mic all the time. But the way to actually organize collectively is to listen when people with lived experience are saying like, yo, this is going to be a problem for me later on. It's something I need to work on too. But if we're actually talking about cross movement solidarity, especially right now, we need to start centering the voices that aren't always given the mic, who aren't going to be on the TV or in the newspaper, like, fuck Twitter. Like, we're actually the people who are <laughs> going to be impacted by what we're talking about, right? And so over the last, like, year and a bit, I think that's what I've been thinking about, is, like, what are the ways I can actually show up that's not just performative or just, like, me pushing my own agenda, like, actually trying to listen and support people who need um, support the most. And sometimes that looks like not always responding to an issue, but providing solutions, right? What can I do where I'm at? It might not be the biggest thing. It might not be a policy thing citywide, but where, what can I do where I'm at to support people who are most, um, who need it the most? And if I can't do it myself, what privilege or power or capacity or resources can I put forward to a movement that's being built? Can I help with media? Can I help with comms? Like, what can I actually put forward to push a movement uh, along that is listening to the people who are the most impacted? And I think that's the hardest part. Allyship 101. Sure, I agree with that. It is a hard part because it calls for personal involvement mm -hmm. and sacrifice on your part, but we need the policies as well. We need to change because these things did not happen by accident. They're designed. Many of these problems that we're talking about have happened by design, and so we need to change the design and think of the city in a, in a different way, a different strategy, aim for helping the majority of the population for a change. I agree with you, but then I also disagree, because how many times have we pushed for policy that sits on a shelf or that's only half implemented? Or, like, at this point, I really believe, and maybe I'm being a bit radical, but we keep us safe. And I'm more interested in figuring out how to like support community on the ground and focusing on policy coming from the hands of people who are going to write it and then not think about the implementation after the fact. 
I, I agree, except that I think in order to get the policy we want, we need to, to, as I was saying earlier, we need to interrupt the circuits of capital, and we need to engage in direct action mm -hmm. yeah. from time to time yeah. in order to make sure that we get that policy, not just appeal to it. But we do, we, we need, like, we cannot, we cannot simply help each other in a bad situation mm -hmm. forever and ever. We have to make the entire situation better. Yeah. So let's talk about interrupting that circuit and interrupting the normal flow of things <laughs> and um, shocking people out of their reverie. Let's talk about the, yeah, let's talk about breaking that circuit and let's talk about s stopping the normal flow of activities. I want to talk about the defund the police uh, piece of work that went along Main Street in front of City Hall mm -hmm. and how that came about. Um, that to me was such an incredible um, wake-up call, I think, for a lot of people. So if you could tell us a bit about your work with the, with the whole defund the police movement and how that thing came about. Well, I mean, first of all, it's not, it wasn't house paint, I just want to say. <laughs> that was bullshit. It, it was wasn't, actually no. very expensive road paint. <laughs> it's good, right? Clarify. Thank you for uh, that. <laughs> thank you. Very conscientious. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... N I don't, like, I don't know how to answer other than to say there are a lot of young people in Hamilton who have been fed up with doing what I was saying earlier, taking meetings with the school board, taking meetings like behind the scenes with politicians to be like, hey, this is an issue, we need your support around policing. And it got to the point around um, when George Floyd died where a bunch of us got on the call and we were like, we're sick of this, like, what do we do? Um, people keep thinking it's not a Canadian issue, even though it is, even though we know of so many Canadians who are black and disabled who get killed and harmed by police um, on mental health calls. DeAndre Cam Campbell, Andrew Loku, um, Regis recently, like a yeah. whole bunch of people who have been harmed just for existing as black and disabled people. And so the defund the police movement is just a bunch of young people wanting to push for attention and change um yeah we've had that recent uh, revelation by the police haven't we that they're they've underspent their budget by what is it five hundred thousand dollars <laughs> yeah <laughs> tanks <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. it's, and it's, so there's room so, there i think we get stuck on like the money piece and it's more about i think the conversation is around like accountability. It's the, what are the structures that exist around policing that allow them to be shit, that allow them to walk around with their own charges and still continue to cause harm, right? It's less so about, yeah, one of the conversations around defending is literally taking money away from police and putting it somewhere else. But deeper than that, it's like, how, how did we get to a point where police have so much power and, and control over what, like the decisions that they're making around budgeting or why is it so difficult for council to hold Chief Gert accountable, oh. right? Why is it so hard to get him to even show up to a meeting? Like how do we yeah, get yeah. to a point where he is the end all be all um, or policing has become so militant that it's hard to even have any say as a citizen around what policing should even look like, right? So I think it's a lot broader and talking about defunding was a way to get um, people on board in terms of the language. Um, and understanding that, hey, the budget actually wasn't super public until we started posting about it. Then all of a sudden it like was appearing. Um, there's more work to be done and we're working on next steps, but it's also like remembering that these movements aren't just about reactions, right? It's not yeah. just about talking about things when there's a hot moment or when someone dies. Like a lot of us are putting blood, sweat and tears into organizing to make sure that People are protected when this stuff happens. We had, just because of paint on the road, we had like young people as young as 18 uh, and 15 being called at home, um, their parents being called by police for very stern warnings. We had like horses wow. following us around for weeks. We had cars parked in front of our buildings and it, it was paint on the road, right? So we can't, we can't do this alone and we really need to make sure that a bunch of people are weighing in on these conversations because it is scary. The police don't mess around. Um, they're not interested in this conversation at all. So when we're talking about defunding the police, it's like when you're called to come out, come out to support. Um, and, and really understand that what we're asking for is not outrageous. We're asking for accountability and to be protected. Because if council won't listen to us, the police are going to harm us. Where do we go for support? 
right? If Each I can't other. call the police because I'm afraid that my brother who has schizophrenia is going to be harmed, yeah. then who do I yeah. call, right? Yeah. Like, if, if not that, then how can we as like communities build a Hamilton where, you know, people living in tents are our neighbors. Like, I feel safe to go to my neighbors for support instead of calling the police. If not the frontline stuff, how are we as a community building spaces where we can rely on one another? And I think that's the other piece of this conversation too. Absolutely. And you talk about, right? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I must, I was extremely impressed to see how strongly defund the police came forward from a very marginal movement to something which people were actually talking about. I'm a strong, very powerful, strong, would be strong in favor of that because the main cost of policing is paying the officers. If you defund them, then you can actually hire people to do things correctly. You would have fewer police officers and the fewer you have, the less harm they can do. <laughs> it's just that straightforward. Well, that's when you see video of them, yeah. you know, murdering a man in Brampton, by climbing onto the balcony, yelling, drop the knife, drop the knife, and then firing into the room, this is straight out murder. There's no, there, there's no two ways about it. So that, that, that attitude of impunity, the fewer individuals you have with weapons, with a sense of complete impunity on the street, the better off we will be. Right. That's, that's Desmond Cole's argument, is that you know, the, if, if policing is intrinsically, inherently, structurally racist, then the only way to reduce the harm of that racism is to reduce the police's ability to project power. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, why, why, why do you have somebody with a gun trained in murder getting dispatched to do a wellness check for somebody who's in crisis. Somebody who's in crisis in large part because of the trauma of, of injustice and inequity that our, system, our society has produced. Like it's, it's this vicious cycle of, of brutalizing a community and then punishing them for being traumatized by that brutalization. It's, it's, it's untenable. I, I, you, know, you know, in the early 90s, um, uh, it was after the end, the, 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 the notorious Bob Ray government brought in uh, civilian oversight for police forces, you know, the, the police services board. This is supposed to be the kind of, um, you know, this is supposed to be the check on police power. But instead, what happened is that the police services boards have been kind of culturally captured by the police. They're now agents, they're, 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 they're there kind of to, to play apologetics and defense for the police rather than to hold them accountable. You know, Lloyd Ferguson will not have a negative word spoken about uh, the, the fine officers. <laughs> and, um, you know, we can get in the, into the a whole debate about, you know, whether it's a few bad apples or a lot of bad apples. But, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, what's the, the, the analogy I heard recently was, you know, policing is like being a pilot. You can't have any bad apples, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, one pilot who's like, you know what, I'm going to fly this plane into the side of a cliff. That's not okay. Like this, you know, we can't afford the luxury of any police officers who think it's okay to go around and murder people. And, you know, the, I mean... You know, the, it, it's, it's been interesting listening to the kind of debate about the defund um, as, a, as, a, as a, a tactic or as a strategy. A lot of people are like, oh, it's, it's too divisive. It's, it's going to, you know, scare middle-aged white people. And as a middle-aged white person, good. <laughs> we need to be scared. <laughs> no, I think it's the dark side of the lack of solidarity that we've been talking about. Because... People understand that they've created a situation which is bad for other people. There's guilt, and, mm -hmm. and there certainly should be. And so you have this idea of the police as some kind of protective element against this, all of these things out there that make you anxious and uneasy and so on. Right? And, and so to get, to end that fear, we have to act in solidarity with each other. Because if you actually get to know these people that live in the other part of town and so on, then you won't be afraid. And you will not require the police to somehow be there in case, in case something should arise out of this horrible situation that we <coughs> have been. Yeah. The police have always been the official agents of the status quo. 
So anytime there's a movement for change, a movement for, for justice, a movement for equity, the police are going to be on the other side of that movement because they're there to protect the way things are right now. And the way things are right now is not good. You know, Sarah? so the police are on the Sarah wrong side of history by, by definition, by, by, by dint of, of why they exist. Exactly. But Sorry, hey, can I just, Sarah's, Sarah's just got a point you wanted to make here for me here. Oh, I was also just going to add, like, we can see that it's not just, although the media frames it as, like, a black issue, who are the people that got called to tear down tents, right? And who've been on video slashing tents? It's also police, right? So it's, you're right in the sense that police are, are not only weapons of the state, but also like weapons of people in positions of power, right? They get called to do um, the dirty work, right? And so understanding that piece and also not just challenging our internalized racism when we're talking about why we need police in our communities, but also ableism, right? Really unpacking this idea that it's disabled people, according to Stats Can, who are twice as more likely mm -hmm. to experience violence and hate crime in Canada. Right? It's not the other way around. You're not at risk by being near someone who's in a crisis. Right? And so really understanding that, that fear and that understanding of why you need police to protect your communities is, is fundamentally rooted in ableism and fear of people who are seen as different, different right? Othering, yeah. and disabled. Right? Really, really getting into that will help you understand why we actually don't need police. We just really need to shift our understanding of who has the right to exist in a space near us, who has the right to be seen as valuable, no matter what. Right? And that's, that's everybody. And that's, and that's a really, really important point is that the police, one of the things they police is who has the right to occupy space. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and, and that's, I mean, I, you know, that's not what, it's not what we should be, you know, spending our, our you know, we, we want to we keep our, our, our property tax bill flat. Why are we spending so much money policing people's right to exist in a space? It's, it's, um, it's, it's inherently contradictory. Because the same people who want their property taxes kept low also want more money spent on getting, you know, people considered undesirable to move away somewhere else. And, you know, and, and, and to make that connection, I think, is really important. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> this has been big questions for sure. It's been some fantastic discussion. We've got, we got a bit of time left. So I do want to, uh, to shift back towards the affordable housing discussion a bit and just talk about um, whether or not there, we've talked a lot about how the, the danger of the, the collapse of affordable housing has been around the private sector uh, getting in, interfering in it. Could you imagine there being, a, but we live in such an economy in this neoliberal framework that we've talked about so many times where private sector is the answer to everything. I mean, I come from the transit world where in the last 10 years we've gone from transit must be built by government to transit must be built by these 3P or 4P partnerships where the uh, private sector apparently assumes the risk, but really what they do is take the profit. And so it's been this shift in approach about how things that we used to pay for collectively out of our tax and now must be done by the private sector. So. I think we all agree around the, 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 the room here that, that solidarity and, and um, government investment is crucial, but is there a role at all to play in the private sector around providing affordable housing? Is this a thing that would even be possible or is it so outside of the context of how they think of things that it's just, just we're going to have to have a whole different discussion? I see a whole bunch of shaking heads here and I expected that, but I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Sean? No, there's no role for private capital to play in housing. It should be a public utility. It should be financed by all of us because the benefits are so great in so many other areas. I mean, one of the great, the social determinants of health, you continually hear it discussed, uh, and they continually research it and so on. It's, it's certainly been well researched. And stable, secure housing is a key to long term mental and physical well being. Since we have a, a publicly funded health care system, it makes no sense to continually incur costs in the system by stressing people under this private real estate regime, uh, particularly rental housing people who don't know what the rent will be next month, don't know what they will do if they will be put out and so on. It's extremely stressful and, and bad for health. No, so no long term, it simply is a lot cheaper to treat housing as a public utility. Of course, if people want to continue to have 
you know, large mansions. McMansions, yes, stuck on McMansions. <laughs> but again, is that what matters in life? Like, who cares? Who gives a shit? Right? Really, right? There actually is. There, is. there is a mechanism by which the private sector provides affordable housing, and that mechanism is it built upscale housing 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> and that's why we have an affordable housing crisis. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, there, there, are, there are other factors, but I mean, all of the quote unquote affordable housing we have now, you know, a lot of these high rise buildings, these were upscale high end apartments when they were built in the 70s and 80s. You know, and then we stopped building um, urban housing for 30 years. Uh, and so we're at a situation now where, you know, I mean, housing goes through, it goes through a long cycle, right? It's, it's, it's upscale, it kind of becomes a little bit more affordable, it becomes a lot more affordable, and then it starts kind of falling off the precipice of disinvestment, it becomes dilapidated, it becomes, you know, unlivable. Like, we, we have, part of the source of our affordable housing crisis is that quote-unquote affordable housing has been dropping off the market because it is deteriorating to the point where it's no longer livable. And then add to that these kind of predatory investment firms which have run out of other places to extract value, and you've written about a lot about this. And so they move into the housing market, buy these older buildings, drive out the tenants, do in some cases fairly superficial renovations to jack the rents back up. So we're essentially, part of our crisis of affordable housing now is that we stopped building upscale housing 30 years ago that could turn into affordable housing now. And that's why we can't count on the private sector to do this because it's just, you can't manage, you can't plan that way. Let Sarah weigh in, let, let Sarah weigh in and then I'm gonna get to my last question. There's not much more to say, I agree with both of you, right? Like, housing should be, I think housing should be free for everybody. On top of a robust universal basic income plan, that's the only way to get through this in, in a way that actually values Canadians and puts people in positions where they can actually take care of themselves. Whether or not they are holding a job or able to be productive, I think we all have the right to a safe home and to be able to eat. A long time ago, I worked for a very radical housing nonprofit in Calgary, which we may not think of as the home of rad radical housing nonprofits, but it was. Uh, and the executive director's uh, motto was, everyone has value. Not something to contribute, that's different. Everyone has value. So yeah, that was a sort of interesting, interesting angle. So I'm going to end with one last question for the, each of the three of you uh, that I want to ask. And that question is, what's next? So what's next in the context of defunding the police? What's next in the context of the fight for affordable housing? And I'm going to start with Ryan around what's next uh, for our quest for LRT. Short term, long term, what's next? <laughs> I don't next? know. Uh, Doug Ford came to Hamilton yesterday and said, it's a good project. So... <laughs> Changes you know, I mean, can, can I end with just the shrug emoji? Um, it, it's, you know, one of the reasons why I, you know, and I sort of alluded to this earlier that I kind of accidentally fell into um, being a transit advocate, but I thought that this was going to be an easy win for Hamilton. You know, all we have to do is say yes to a fully funded transit investment. Uh, and so you can imagine, you know, it's a little bit dispiriting to think that if, you know, if we can't, if we can't get something as easy as a fully funded transit system that the senior levels of government committed to paying for, um, the prospects for getting the government to do the other things we need them to do are fairly low. And so I think what's next is we really, uh, and it's going to tie back into what Sean has been saying, it's going to tie back into what Sarah has been saying, is that we need to stop waiting for them and expecting them to do what we need them to do and we need to start getting more directly involved we need to you know and i'm speaking for myself as well uh be more present you know to be to to actually show up more and uh, and disrupt the kind of consensus trance that has allowed us to accept that the way things are is acceptable consensus trance that's a great phrase I wish I could take credit for it. Sean, what's next for the affordable housing fight in, in Hamilton? Well, there are some basic things that need to happen. We need rent control to come back mm -hmm. to stop the continual acceleration of rents. We need real, the Real Estate Investment Trust to be discontinued as a financial instrument in this country. That's something the federal government can do. They discontinued a lot of trusts at one point. Um, and then we need to have in each city, again, uh, rather than waiting for money to continue to, to begin to flow from the province or from the federal government, as our municipal politicians continually do, 
We need to, to establish a housing authority which would actually begin to build. And they could begin by building the modular housing, which is required by the people that are at the very bottom of the, of, who are actually homeless at the moment, and then continue to work upward from there. At the moment, what you have is a system of private-public partnerships, which don't actually produce anything that's particularly affordable, and they are consuming large tracts of land which previously were given over to social housing. And the city needs to also start retaining, stop selling off land. Do not sell off 125 Barton, next door to us here. Do not be selling off large tracts like this whole Barton Tiffany tract, which is supposed to eventually become a film studio. Keep that land because one of the keys to reducing the cost of building affordable housing is the price of the land. So if we own it already, keep it. And then develop an actual plan for how you will build affordable housing on here, which means you produce the pro forma, which says affordability means 30% of income, not mm. something about market the value, market yeah. rate and so on. 30% of income is geared to income, or 45% of income, including transportation costs. And so you have to look at each area of the city. If the transportation is good, then you don't need to worry about that piece. If the transportation is bad, then you need to factor that in. And then the cost of land, the cost, the assessment that the city requires or thinks it requires to service the land, and so on. You lay out all of those items, and then you begin to negotiate them, and you produce actual affordable housing built by a public utility run by the city of Hamilton. Fantastic. Sarah, last word to you. What's next for defund the police? I mean, I can't really say too much publicly, but what I will say is that when there's a call to come out to support, come out to support, because if we're asking, that means we seriously need people on the ground. I think the game plan for a lot of the conversations around housing and policing is to at, like to build up pressure and to escalate pressure leading up to the next two election cycles. Because we know that without pressure, um, politicians will just continue to say what they think we want to hear without actually implementing what it is we're demanding on the ground. So pay attention. Pay attention to what people in your communities are doing. And when that call out comes, don't show up and take a picture. Ask, what can I do to support? What can I bring? What skills do I have to contribute to the movement? Right. And so I think these are some things that can be done around all the issues that we talked about today. Um, I'm not going to get too much into details because it's just not safe to talk about yeah, what's sure. next. Absolutely. Thank you for that. This has been required viewing for anybody in Hamilton who is passionate about making our city a better place. So a huge thanks to Ryan McGreal, Sean Selby, and Sarah Jama for your, uh, for your contributions today. If you don't already have a copy of Reclaiming Hamilton, uh, run, don't walk to your nearest independent bookstore and, uh, and grab it. Uh, it's, it's in all the indies in Hamilton right now, and uh, it's... Uh, it's a great, great read. I'm really enjoying my, my look through the essays, and uh, you're going to want to run and get a copy. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>